All right. Hello. This is another What Are They Up To? It's uh, been a very busy earnings season as investors really look to digest kind of what is the new normal uh, for some companies. If you think back last year at this time, uh, it was pretty difficult to gauge kind of what rest of year would look like. And I think what you're seeing now is kind of a year later, uh, that same complication is coming to fruition again as we lap uh, a pretty tough uh, comparison just simply from trying to understand what the new normal, uh, again, what the, for these new companies uh, tends to look like. In addition, what we wanted to do today was really cover, um, uh, again, some ideas around companies, but also sentiment swings and, and ideas around inflation because we have a perspective there. I also have Chris Fuentes, our analyst. He'll break some things down. Uh, I have several topics that I'll discuss, so inflation and sentiment around that um, and some of the volatility that's been created there. Uh, High-level view of companies such as uh, Electronic Arts and Omnicell, and then dig a little bit into Aterian slash Mohawk and some of the information that's going on there. Um, but Chris, welcome. I'll pass it to you. What are some topics uh, that you'll be covering today? Hey, Sean. Uh, thanks for having me. And yeah, I mean, as, as you said, we're going to be going over some companies, uh, but also some high level topics. But some of the companies I'll be going over today are, you know, some of the larger stories that we've been following very closely. This includes uh, Facebook and Google, which fits uh, really well into our structural theme of uh, our theme of structural growth. Uh, but then also smaller companies on a relative scale like Wish, uh, which also fit into our uh, themes regarding commerce. So cool. Yeah, looking forward there. Um, before that, I wanted to give a little disclaimer. Everything uh, discussed herein is for educational purposes only. Any statements made are not an endorsement of any company or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold any security. It should not be uh, assumed that recommendations made in the future will be profitable. In addition, Avery's views may change as facts change uh, in the future. Uh, investments involve risk and do not guarantee that investments will appreciate. That's the fun part. Um, now, on to inflation. I think the important aspect here, and here's our perspective, is really it's important to match inflation expectations really with your investment time horizon. So we've seen a lot of obviously uh, debates and topics around inflation. Uh, and given our approach of investing with a time horizon well in excess of kind of like days and months and quarters and even years, again, we're looking out three, five, seven years. So I think it's prudent to really push and pull or think about the push and pull of inflation over that duration of time. Um, our view uh, kind of at a basic level is that technology in itself will continue to be a deflationary force uh, that will pressure inflation for many decades. Um, the ramp of technology uh, today is being embedded into all types of companies, and that's actually accelerating, not decelerating. Uh, and I believe probably a pretty good analogy here is, is oil and how technology really created a def deflationary outcome over the last several decades. Now, some stats around that is consumption of oil over the last two decades has uh, nearly doubled. Yet prices, when looking at, th at that, it's rate, uh, stayed rather consistent in both nominal terms and adjusted for inflation and actually declined when you, when you adjust for inflation. And the simple question there is why? And the simple answer is obviously technology because one, while our consumption has doubled, the efficiency of that consumption has declined at a much more rapid pace. So take uh, a stat like the average miles per gallon for cars. As an example, in 1975, it was roughly 15 miles per gallon. Today, this figure is approaching the mid thirties. Um, so we're consuming more, but we're consuming more with less. And again, that's a byproduct of technology uh, being embedded in uh, our consumption kind of tools or vehicles. The supply side is the same thing though. And we're seeing similar dynamics there as really the ability to produce has improved dramatically through technology. Companies like Halliburton and some others have really embedded technology into how they drill, pump, uh, and produce. And, and again, I think that's an interesting concept of uh, how thinking out uh, over multiple years and decades and the reality of uh, the implications of technology into something that was once in incredibly inflationary. And this happened to energy. But for us, when we think in towards the future, we think th this same concept is happening uh, against two other large industries. When we think of the future, there's two areas that have seen massive inflation for decades that are just beginning to uh, get disrupted. 
and price points will likely deflate instead of inflate. Uh, I think when we sit down 10 years from now, which is a long time, but 10 years from now, and these two areas are education, healthcare, uh, education, inflation is up over like 500% since the mid eighties and companies like Coursera, who just went public are building out uh, marketplaces where education is reduced to levels well below that of its existing like price points. If you take uh, Google, for example, they partnered with Coursera uh, and they created a certificate program that's roughly like 39 bucks a month. And once you complete this course, kind of your certificate sent out to hundred of the top companies in the world. So again, there, there we're totally rethinking how education and then access to companies uh, is evolving. And we think while the current education system today won't be flipped on its head overnight, we do think this is the beginning of a massive deflationary force that will come over the next decade. Um, flipping to healthcare, I think, this has obviously been a, a large problem um, in the U.S. Uh, in terms of pricing. Now, as a whole, you, you may see some inflation there uh, simply due to some of the inefficiencies that still remain and likely will remain given just like legacy incumbency. We do think things like automation is creeping in, telehealth uh, due to COVID is, is increasing throughput. Technology providers like GoodRx, who again also went public recently, are creating price discovery mechanisms for medications. We know Amazon's moving into health. They've obviously announced uh, pharmacy. They have announced recently diagnostics. We have OmniCell, which is an investment of ours, is automating parts of the pharmacy. And, and again, there's a list of companies doing what's right for health outcomes and also right for prices. And we think that's going to be, again, a, a large deflationary force over the coming decade. Now, most importantly, is kind of the current events, right? We turn to recent figures. So while bigger picture, we do think deflationary forces are much larger than inflationary forces. The next two to three months will showcase inflation pressures. And, and this makes sense. Obviously, if you think back March, April, May uh, of 2020, you saw negative month over month inflation readings. So we're lapping those similar to how uh, companies that were closed last year are seeing strong year over year numbers. Uh, inflation is doing the same. So if we take uh, a much more simplistic view, we know that what we witnessed was drastic shifts in behavior, which led to kind of like sudden moves in supply chains and similar uh, dramatic shifts in, in demand. And if we take an example like Hertz, which is the car rental company, which looked to, to raise cash during this time of last year, um, they basically sold all their cars to raise cash only to find out that six months later, they needed to uh, build up their inventory again and their fleet and they became a large buyer of used vehicles. At the same time, used car dealerships were suddenly um, drying up and, and not buying inventory, trying to maintain cash as well, only to again find out that they quickly had to build up their inventory uh, pools once again. And again, you're seeing this massive shift between demand and supply, which is causing all types of imbalances in price. Um, the other components outside of just used car vehicles are things like lodging, airfares, food away from home, lumber prices is getting uh, a lot of uh, conversation. And again, it's it, it's due to sudden shifts in in dwelling habits and all types of demand, uh, but also bottlenecks within supply. So wrapping it all together here in terms of concept, um, when you break out the recent inflation readings, roughly like 60% of the month over month increase in headline inflation was comprised of um, uh, roughly like five components. So used cars, rental cars, uh, lodging, airfares, and food away from home. And those should subside in the coming months. So we know that part of the, the equation should subside somewhat. There are some uh, inflation areas that should stick in terms of, we, we do realize that uh, housing inventory is at record lows, and that will continue to stay there as those millennials that are buying are typically not selling, right? They're, they're generally speaking, we're renters or living at home. Um, so their inventory is not coming on the market. So that should stick for a little bit longer. But again, we think the main cause here of all this is the level of disruption that has taken place uh, on the supply and demand side. But at the same time, we think there's a massive deflationary force, which is much stronger uh, when you match up your investment time horizon with kind of your time horizon on inflation. Um, and last little note on kind of inflation is really around how it's impacted markets. And we think that the market is obviously kind of shoes first, ask questions later. 
And given the perceived nature of higher inflation for longer, this has led to selling pressure and even kind of short selling pressure on many areas. And this includes areas like IPOs and SPACs and high revenue multiple companies, uh, companies with less or little uh, profitability. And if we think of, if we had this environment like 10 years ago, those companies that uh, would be in focus would be companies that were break even or unprofitable. The Amazons of the world, um, the Netflixes of the world, and, and many others that would have been uh, the best investments 10 years ago that were being impacted due to short-term sentiment um, uh, ideas. Now, we own several companies that fit these criteria. Most of ours do not, but internally, again, we tend to look past these sentiment changes and, and market pressures. And we do believe, again, that the eventual drivers of any investment is the underlying company and really building out your thesis from uh, building out key like key performance indicators and understanding how do we get from A to Z. Uh, that's the, the most important thing w we do. Um, now, how we, we tend to think about that is, again, uh, highlighting some of the, uh, the fundamental behaviors that are happening within our companies. And what I wanted to do was obviously start there and I'll turn it to Chris so he can share some company highlights on the two companies that he mentioned before. And that's what we'll do. We'll start there. So I'll turn it back to you, Chris. Thanks, Sean. And yeah, I think everything that you mentioned is not only incredibly relevant, but also shows up in a lot of the companies that we that we follow closely. Uh, these companies are sort of attacking the you know the high inflation areas, and, and again, starting to deflate prices. And again, not through um, not in a standardized way, but largely in just the way that they're approaching the technology aspect of it. So how can they improve efficiencies and uh, ultimately lower barriers to entry, increase competition in a way, and some active platforms to lower prices. So that, that's been incredibly interesting to watch over the past couple of uh, years or even decades, I'd say. But yeah, I mean, some of the larger companies that we have been following closely you know, for a long time now, uh, Facebook and Google. So I'll, I'll go ahead and start with Facebook. And uh, this fits into you know, a structural growth story. It's been growing for quite some time in, in different areas as well. And so I'll break it down into three areas. Uh, the first being advertising, so just a legacy advertising business, which is funny to say, right? It's been internet ads for for quite some time, but it's actually disrupting the the real legacy ad businesses, which um, are not on the internet. So think of offline ads and and things like that. So just high level, as more people go online, ads shift online, and so you don't really have that many uh, strong providers of advertising solutions on the internet. Just really Facebook and, and Google. So Facebook fits that mold really well. And so what we've seen is. Uh, ad prices increase over time and the number of ads being delivered also increasing over time just as a kind of an indicator of this theme or reinforcing this theme. Uh, what they've built is actually again quite impressive. So this past quarter reporting 2.7 billion uh, monthly active people, actually daily active people, I'm sorry. And if you just think about A, the, the percentage of people on the world of the world that that comprises, it's already eye opening. But if you, I think you have to compare it to then and asking questions like what percentage of people worldwide or even connected to the internet in the first place. Uh, and it's a little bit over 50%. So, you know, even at 60%, that's still a really strong share of, of internet connected people, if you will. Uh, so that's the core, but you know, that has ultimately enabled them to build into two other areas. Uh, so one of them being computing. And when I say computing, I really mean augmented reality and, and virtual reality. Uh, so they, they've long been seen as maybe a an early innovator in that space and, and their products might not necessarily be, you know, the number one leader, but um, in terms of absolute scale and size, but they still are, you know, a leading player and they're growing quickly. And we, we saw that pop up this quarter as well with, uh, with Mark Zuckerberg doubling down in that category with Quest 2 and he specifically cited increased engagement, increased adoption, and ultimately highlighting that we're at an inflection point there. So critically, you know, wireless experience being the the highlight there. So if we think about virtual reality and augmented reality, these have been really hardware centric pain points and, and having a lot of wires to connect latency issues. And so by providing a, a low latency wireless experience, this is really like a technological breakthrough in that area. Um, and then also complementing that is the ecosystem. So you can't just have the hardware and, and you know the standalone software, really the ecosystem is where things start to uh, really unfold. And so we've seen the Oculus store uh, so a lot of innovation take place there. So if we think about, you know, where the app store was even a couple of years ago, uh, it, it was nowhere near where it is today. And you just continue to see a lot of innovation take place. So by letting developers come on and, and letting, in, in, a, in a sense, merchants are 
uh, app developers or whoever sells these apps and creates them. Uh, new use cases are going to come to life, and it's just going to reinforce the flywheel of innovation there. Um, so we, we've seen use cases pop up for you know social reasons, but also fitness reasons and a lot of things like that. So you know the key key point there just being there's still an early uh, innovator in the space, but the space as a whole is still fairly early on, and, and that's both exciting, um, you know, but also yet to be seen really what the full potential could be there. And then last but not least, definitely is commerce. So commerce for Facebook, again, just being probably one of the largest opportunities for them. If you think about how much, uh, you know, dollars per year in terms of sales are going to be flowing online. So trillions of GMV flowing online in the future, and, and that can be broken down into maybe more commoditized marketplaces like Amazon, uh, but then also direct to consumer brands, companies like Allbirds, or, or Kylie Cosmetics, which have created Shopify stores and are you know approaching e-commerce from a different way. So, right off the bat, that's been you know incredibly interesting to watch. In this past quarter, they reported uh, one million monthly active shops uh, and two hundred fifty million monthly shop visitors, which is again interesting. Not only is that a relatively large number, so if you think about companies like Shopify, Shopify, I think they noted they had about one point seven million merchants as of early twenty twenty one. So pretty comparable in scale. And if you think about how long these two businesses have been around, uh, specifically, you know, the shops component of Facebook and Shopify as a whole, I think uh, Facebook is definitely, you know, has some strong momentum there. And it's just incredible the scale that they've built. But also it sits in a sweet spot. So not only are they large, but they also have a lot of room to run, which I think is just another thing to make note of. And then another part of commerce, uh, you know, Facebook Marketplace. And I tweeted about this the other day. It's, it's funny. Uh, Facebook Marketplace, they reported, has now over 1 billion monthly active users, which, again, is very impressive, especially when you compare it to a legacy company like eBay, which has been widespread horizontal marketplace uh, for quite some time, has 187 million monthly uh, or active buyers, and the company in the public markets is worth over 40 billion. So you start asking questions you know, about what these different components could be worth down the road, and I think uh, the opportunity set looks really fascinating. And, and the story is very similar for Google, although sort of in a different um, in a different way. So also the core business being advertising, but now kind of they've layered on you know Google Cloud through GCP and, and software suites that they're offering enterprise customers. And so Google Cloud as a whole just continuing to grow smoothly, uh, faster than the segment overall. So we know that that's over you know fifty percent year over year. Um, and then specifically focusing and doubling down on BigQuery to be able to add value and differentiate from other uh, players, but then also uh, taking all of that and, and adding on to that the, the, the enterprise software component. So they have G Suite and Workspace. So you know people that have been keeping up with Google I/O, the event for the past couple of days, they announced some some new additions to Workspace, specifically Smart Canvas, which again just enables better integrations and connectivity between using you know Google Sheets, Google Docs, but then also integrating Google Meets. Uh, so very much like an end-to-end -end solution for enterprises. Uh, and that, again, just all goes back to adding value. And then on the commerce front, again, not just online, but a mix. And here's where I think Google differentiates and takes advantage of some of the other assets that they own. So they're combining things like search and maps and even YouTube uh, to kind of provide a very interesting experience for consumers. And then all of, all of this rolls over ultimately to the merchants uh, so they can sell this to you know Michaels or they also mentioned exporting goods, which now have some sort of hybrid uh, e-commerce model, so whether that be buy online or pick up in store or something like that, uh, where they can really leverage this in-store uh, or discovery component where you're going to a brick and mortar store, but uh, there's still an online software component where they they come in. And so, uh, you know, just in commerce in general, 1 billion shopping searches per day, which is very impressive. Um, and then you have other, you know, small components which continue to play out. You have Waze, Maps, and Waymo, the combination of, you know, we, we think could be something incredibly valuable down the road. Uh, and then even, you know, you mentioned education and we looked at Coursera, but even YouTube, uh, they mentioned 77% of respondents in a survey said they learned a new skill on YouTube. So even thinking about YouTube as an education platform uh, is interesting. So these companies just continue to innovate. Uh, they continue to attack these large markets. And I think the opportunity set still remains incredibly attractive. Yeah, no, interesting. Um... The Google number, the the a billion searches uh, a day on commerce. That's pretty fascinating. I'll um I'll pick it up from there uh, and turn to two companies, Omnicell and Electronic Arts. Um, Omnicell, so they continue to provide value to health systems and and really patients. Um, their business remains a, a market leader within medication management using robotics and moving more into software and services, really to provide insights. 
So again, these medication management uh, uh, kind of uh, systems that sit inside of the health systems, uh, whether it's the XR2 platform, which is the robotic uh, or robot that sits at the bottom of a health system holds roughly like 33,000 SKUs, or you have the decentralized kind of medication stations that sit across the floors. All of this is filled with all types of potential data. So their analytics division and the software stack that they're building uh, has some pretty interesting promise considering they, they control roughly 50% of this market and their contracts with their providers are roughly 10 years sole sourced. So really well positioned there. Uh, despite COVID, uh, OmniCell did hit a billion dollars in product bookings. And this is really a key milestone that uh, we are and have been excited to witness. Uh, we have been invested in this company since uh, they were at half that number, right? So here's a company that kind of is incredibly under the radar that is executing at a pretty high level, founder led with with Randall Lips. And, and again, the team there has done uh, wonderful things. Uh, margins continue to move higher. They reiterated their uh, uh, five-year plan, but now four years plan of $2 billion in revenue in 2025. Uh, that's essentially double from here. Uh, management tends to guide pretty conservatively, so take that for what it is. Uh, but strong fingers, figures from OmniCell, and I expect uh, plenty of new uh, solutions and announcements here to come in the near future. Uh, Electronic Art, so turning to them, obviously, uh, they sit in a pretty interesting kind of structural trend around um, uh, interactive entertainment. We do think gaming and entertainment and, and social are all kind of converging. Um, the, we've seen management here recently turn and lean harder into their sports category. So they're already the leader in, in sports, uh, with, with titles such as FIFA Madden as really their, their horses, but have recently announced college football is coming back. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped about that. Uh, a new golf title, uh, they acquired Codemasters, which has the F1, uh, racing franchise, um, and they acquired Metalhead, which owns Super Mega Baseball. So leaning into their strengths, I think that's always a positive. Uh, now, categories beyond sports are also uh, starting to become exciting for us. If you think about uh, what's happened over the last couple of years, literally a little bit more than two years ago, they launched Apex Legends. And the franchise to date has witnessed over $1 billion in lifetime bookings. Uh, IGN, which is one of the bigger uh, gaming media kind of outlets, named Apex the number one battle royale game. So this is ahead of Fortnite, Call of Duty, Warzone, and PUBG. So whether you agree with that kind of rating or not, I think it just does speak to their success and and respawn, which is one of their studios' ability to launch and scale games uh, to this level uh, in in a pretty short order. It also sets them up nicely because this game is incredibly um wide ranging in terms of its its function everything from their they're launching mobile they're launching uh, cross platforms and some other things so during the recent quarter what what did we see we saw record revenue record operating cash flow uh they expect all of this can to continue all the data that we see supports the fact that gaming is uh seeing a or saw a record amount of of new users in 2020 and it looks like many of these players are sticking around uh, despite kind of lockdowns um, um, being removed. In addition, we think the future is even brighter. Games are becoming more immersive. Games are moving, again, cross platforms. So things like Xbox players can play against play play PlayStation players and against mobile. And we think ultimately what that does is drive network effects across player bases. And at a high level, EA remains cash rich. They generate a significant amount of cash flow. They're returning uh, uh, some of this cash flow to shareholders in the form of buybacks. Uh, they're recently announced dividend, but they're also investing in growth uh, through new titles. So they have a huge slate this year, but also through acquisitions with the, the the two acquisitions that I mentioned earlier. So all in all, they sit in an interesting space that continues to grow. Part of a structural growth story that we are we've been following and tracking, um, and a lot of exciting stuff there. Now. Turning it back to you, Chris, I know you wanted to talk about Wish, and then I'll talk about Atarian uh, uh, slash Mohawk, and then we can wrap it up. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, sounds good. And so I guess just starting back with Wish, you know, thinking about their quarter, but then also thinking about the story there. Um, 
So again, fitting into one of our structural uh, growth buckets here, specifically uh, what the future of commerce might look like. And so at the very core is just more people going online. Uh, and again, just reiterating more people shopping online. And so this also means, you know, the value conscious consumer, which is something that has not been spoken a lot about. And reason being combination of reasons really, right? So first you have costly friction points. So not only shipping, which might be relatively expensive for somebody who's not willing to, um, you know, wait a long time and then also needs products at a relatively low price point. But then there's also other friction points might include payments. Uh, you know, these individuals might be underbanked, et cetera. So thinking about who that core customer is, um, it's, it's usually going to be somebody who maybe has never even shopped online to begin with uh, because their needs could never be met or it never was facilitated in a way, um, you know, that made it convenient for them. So Wish has kind of transformed that. And, you know, this quarter has been just reinforcing that story. So I think we saw their business do, honestly, probably the best it's ever done in terms of revenue. So in dollars per active buyer uh, or revenue per active buyer. So that, you know, again, just being at a relatively high point, uh, if not an all-time high. And then the interesting, I think, driver here is also the logistics business. So as we think about all the friction points that usually are, uh, that these shoppers are faced with, uh, and even, you know, this is across the spectrum, uh, time to door is the metric that they use, and this ultimately ties back to delivery times have historically been long. And so the logistics business, I think, has the, you know, potential to kind of lower that. And there's a chain of events that follow from that. So logistics, you know, at the very base level has been growing hundreds of percentages a year. So they reported 338% growth year over year. Again, that's comping over a quarter last year. That was, you could say it was easy to beat. So even looking at pre-COVID numbers or even quarters after that, I mean, you're still talking about a business that's doubling or more, uh, tripling year over year. Uh, so that's incredibly exciting. So what that enables them to do, right, is turn that over to conversion. So what happens if you're a consumer and you're shopping online and now all of a sudden, something that you're ordering is, is now not going to get here a month from now, but only a week from now. So that ties in the whole story of convergence. So now you have an MAU base that they've been able to retain fairly well. So if you look at the MAU base over the past couple of quarters, I mean, it's been relatively stagnant. Uh, so it hasn't been growing significantly, but also hasn't been showing significant deterioration. And so what happens if you can convert more of those MAUs to buyers, uh, which today sits at around 60%, then I think the story gets interesting because then you can talk about, you know, do these people get more engaged? Do they spend more on the platform? Uh, and so all of this just ties into the flywheel, enables them to kind of grow revenue, reduce the costs, uh, get lower, you know, per unit uh, delivery prices, et cetera, which ultimately all circles back to the merchant um, and the consumer at the, at the end of it. Um, and then we also saw some other interesting development. We saw Jackie Reese uh, being assigned a different role, a more day-to-day -day role at Wish. And so she previously, you know, she's somebody who we've looked up to in the past, even before Wish, and specifically her role at Square, uh, where she led the financial services initiatives there uh, with Square Capital lead. Uh, and so all of that just being a really good indicator, again, not just the outcome, right? So not just that she is involved, but also the indicator that, um, you know, kind of validates Wish as a business in terms of quality, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, over the long run, I think there's other opportunities uh, that are still in their very early days. So opening up the logistics business to non-Wish merchants. Uh, so this means, not only you know transportation, et cetera, all of which sits upon like a third party uh, structure, but then also Wish Local, which has enabled them again, uh, as we spoke about in the report that we uh, issued out a couple of days ago, it lets them essentially expand at a very, very low cost, um, you know, if not no cost at all. So that's been really exciting to see as well. But you know, at the end of the day, the story continues to, to move on and there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, again, the key driver, I think, being that logistics component of the business and what that does to the customer experience, which all feeds back into the merchant side of the business uh, through things like product boost, which are ads, uh, et cetera. So very exciting business. And, you know, we continue to follow it very closely. Nice. Yeah, I think um, the optionality around uh, a cohort of, of buyers that um, is essentially the forgotten, right, in terms of their uh, demographic uh, with the potential optionality there of 60 million plus buyers and 100 million plus users, uh, global and a logistics net network kind of wrapping this all together, we think the next two to three years can be pretty interesting for this business. And again, that's how we think about it is years out, not kind of days or quarters. Um, now, flipping to uh, Atarian slash Mohawk, um, I'll take 
on that one. It's really been a battle around kind of uh, investment over the last six months with pretty interesting uh, moves in both directions. Uh, we do think this makes some sense in terms of uh, as companies are misunderstood, they tend to create kind of these polarized views. Uh, we saw this kind of early days of, of Square and Etsy and Wix and, and many others, uh, a laundry list of successful uh, businesses before them. What they all had in common was that they, uh, one, were misunderstood, and two, they executed wonderfully, which then eventually rewarded um, their constituents. Now, Ethereum is essentially the only public company here focused on building products for marketplaces like Amazon. So again, they've built out uh, their own kind of internal software, and that's really their, call it the quarterback of the business. And that really is what drives the leverage or the, the uh, potential margin capabilities within this business. And again, companies focused on building products and optimizing them specifically for marketplaces where reviews and rankings are essentially the brand and what drives conversion. We think there's going to be many winners here, and this is the early days of this. Um, and those that uh, firms that invest kind of today for the future, we think uh, will again be rewarded at some point in time. Um, as I mentioned before, some of this, uh, uh, kind of different parts of the markets have been fueled by either short attacks and or speculative parts. For someone like Ethereum, we don't think it's warranted. If we, if we step back for a second and gauge where the company was, let's say 6, 12, 18 months ago versus where it was today, we think the fundamental improvements have been somewhat exponential. Um, and we think that alone warrants a rise in value. Um, and if, if we step back and look at the numbers or think about them, in 2019, this company generated roughly $114 million in sales, and they were burning roughly $54 million in EBITDA. In 2020, um, this grew to uh, $185 million in sales, again, compared to 114. EBITDA was around negative 21 million, again, up from or an improvement from negative 54. Uh, and this year, they now expect roughly $375 million uh, in 2021. Uh, and again, that compares to 185 and 114 uh, and expect to generate roughly uh, $30 million or so in positive EBITDA in 2021. So we're talking about nearly a, a triple in revenue from 2019 and a 80 to $90 million swing in EBITDA over that time as well. Um, so we think that alone is obviously uh, incredibly uh, uh, compelling from an execution standpoint. And we know that they've they've done this through building uh, one their new products and launching new products across many of their brands, but also through acquisitions uh, that they've been able to stitch on to their Amy product. And you're seeing some of that that cash drop to the bottom line, even while they reinvest for the future. Um, again, when we think about Atarian, and we talked about it uh, on our last call, is we focus on the sustained revenue. This is the core of the business, and this is the core of the business in theory. If they stopped reinvesting. And these are essentially the most durable and profitable products within their growing product portfolio. Uh, if we look at this, this segment nearly is uh, 87, 90% of sales and is seeing 52.6% gross margins uh, and 18.8% operating margins. Uh, for example, it's not a direct comparable by any stretch, but Twilio has 56% uh, gross margins. Um, so now 2021 and 2020, 2022 for us are, are big years for this company. Over the next several quarters, we, we uh, expect to see uh, some traction internationally as they look to expand there. They did acquire Photo Direct, uh, which uh, is an acquisition uh, that they just made on the prior call. And this company was based out of the UK. And if you look at their product portfolio, it's incredibly boring. And we think boring is good, uh, specifically on these channels. And we expect to see improvements within other marketplaces, specifically Walmart, uh, over the coming years. And again, I'm highlighting years uh, uh, specifically, uh, as today it's a smaller channel, uh, but we think it's a channel that is growing And Walmart on their last earnings call um, over the last several days has emphasized um, that this is an important part of the future of their business. So being early there, we think is important. And then the platform as a service model, while not something we've placed any value to yet in terms of what we think um, the, the company is worth as a whole, we have seen hints of some incremental traction here. And Yaniv mentioned some exciting things going on there at the Needham event uh, over the past week. So we'll see what that is. We don't know. Um, so that's really it. I mean, we think that that's our quick thoughts there. 
in terms of uh, volatility versus fundamentals. Fundamentals are, are pretty clear in terms of directionally what's happening. Um, and then uh, the things that we're looking out for over the next quarters and years um, that we think could transpire to make an even more exciting story. Um, so that's really it this month. Obviously, again, uh, covering inflation and our view there is essentially looking longer term. We think technology is a deflationary force, not an inflationary force. That type of pressure is going to be hard to um, get over in terms of trying to drive uh, true inflation higher. And we think over the, the near term, again, uh, uh, months and quarters, you could continue to see uh, sentiment shifts around inflation fears. Um, and that's to be expected. Again, uh, the world is still volatile in terms of the reopenings and closings that are we're lapping. So uh, it will be interesting in that aspect. Uh, on top of that, again, talking about all the companies that we just mentioned, uh, Electronic Arts, OmniSale, Facebook, Google, Wish, Ethereum, uh, from a fundamental perspective, looking out uh, multiple years, uh, we think incredibly well positioned um, for what's to come. So that's really it. I know it was quite long. There were many things to speak of, uh, but there was, again, so many things happening this last month from earnings to conferences to uh, volatility and inflation and all types of sentiment changes. Uh, but with that, uh, I'll leave it there. And yeah, have a, a great rest of your day and we'll be back, be back next month.